The following recording is a presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Rohnert Park, California, and of Pastor Val Mark Smith. We are an independent Baptist congregation committed to the accurate presentation of the historical doctrines of the faith. We welcome you to visit our services anytime here in the Rohnert Park area. Good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning service of the Berean Baptist Church. We begin our services today with the call to worship. I'd like you to take your Bibles and open them to Psalm 18. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 18 and we'll read verses 1 through 15. Psalm 18. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured, coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly, yea, and he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place, his pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of waters were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils." Would you join with us in singing two songs, Christ the Sure and Steady Anchor and Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul. Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm. When the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn. In the suffering, in the sorrow, when my sinking hopes are few, I will hold fast. To the anchor, it shall never be removed. Christ, the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true, we will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Christ, the sure and steady anchor, while the tempest rages on when temptation claims the battle and it seems the night is won deeper still then goes the anchor though i justly stand accused i will hold fast to the anchor it shall never be removed. Christ, the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true, we will hold fast 
to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Christ the sure and steady anchor through the floods of unbelief. Hopeless somehow, oh my soul, now lift your eyes to Calvary. This my ballast of assurance, see his love forever proved. I will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Christ, the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true. We will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Christ, the sure and steady anchor, as we face the wave of death. When these trials give way to glory, as we draw our final breath, we will cross that great horizon, clouds behind and life secure, and the calm will be the better for the storms that we endure. Christ, the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true, we will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Christ, the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true. We will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be removed. Dear refuge of my weary soul, on thee when sorrows rise, on thee when waves of trouble roll, my fainting hope relies. To thee I tell each rising grief, for thou alone canst heal. Thy word can bring a sweet relief for every pain I feel. But oh, when gloomy doubts prevail, I fear to call thee mine. The springs of comfort seem to fail, and all my hopes decline. Yet, gracious God, where shall I flee? Thou art my only trust. And still my soul would cleave to thee, though prostrate in the dust. Hast thou not bid me seek thy face, and shall I seek in vain? And can the ear of sovereign grace be deaf when I complain? No, still the ear of sovereign grace attends the mourner's prayer. 
Oh, may I ever find access to breathe my sorrows there. Thy mercy seat is open still. Here let my soul retreat. With humble hope, attend thy will and wait beneath thy feet. Thy mercy seat is open still. Here let my soul retreat with humble hope attend thy will and wait beneath thy feet amen i'd like for you to take your bibles this morning and open them to the sixth chapter of Hebrews. Today is our third Sunday morning without the assembly of the church. The coronavirus keeps us at home today and this message is to make the Word of God available to you as you worship at home with your families on this Sunday morning. I've chosen as my text for today's message Hebrews chapter 6 verses 13 through 20 and the title of the message is Christ the Sure and steady anchor. And I'm sure you recognize that title because we've just sung it in the song uh, earlier. Uh, this is a song that we've recently added to our worship services. I'm sure that Matt Boswell and Matt Pompa, who wrote this song, had this text in Hebrews in mind and perhaps also the story in Matthew chapter 8 of Christ with his disciples in the storm on the sea. The first verse of the, of the song says, Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm, when the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn. In the suffering, in the sorrow, when my sinking hopes are few, I will hold fast to the anchor. It shall never be removed. Christ the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true, we will hold fast to the anchor. It shall never be removed. I find those words to be most appropriate for the trying times that we face. We need assurance that God is always faithful and we can hold on to him by our faith in Jesus Christ and we can feel the blessed assurance he has for our souls. Now in Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse number 13, the holy word of God says, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In verse number 19, the author said, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Now, the author says that hope, is the anchor of the soul. And this hope is sure because Christ himself is our hope. As the immutable God, he is unchangeable. Every promise that he makes is trustworthy and secure. But understand the 
reason that the author wrote these words, we need to investigate the background of this letter. To be so emphatic about hope and so insistent upon the believer's assurance, there must have been a cause of doubt. There must have been a cause of their anxiety and uneasiness. There must have been a need to reassure these Christians of the character of Christ that knowing who he is and what he did is reason enough to dispel all our doubts. Troubling times are fertile ground for doubts to grow. Anxiety can be crippling to God's people. And so we need to know where our faith is grounded uh, uh, that we might be assured that we have no reason to fear. The title of the New Testament epistle, Hebrews, tells us to whom this letter was written. It was to Hebrews, that is Jewish Christians, who in the beginning of their faith faced persecution. They heard the gospel and they had come to faith in Christ. But true to Christ's warnings and the apostles' warnings, following Christ is not for the faint-hearted. Following Christ is to invite trouble because Christ said, in this world you will have tribulation. Now, far back in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, the scripture said that Christ would be despised. He would be rejected of men. It said that he would be put to grief. It said he would be oppressed and he would be afflicted. That was prophetic and it happened. And Jesus said, if you follow me, you can expect that the same will happen to you. And because of this, the apostle Paul wrote that suffering is to be expected. He said that Christians are designed for trouble. He said, you were appointed to believe in Christ, and also you were appointed to suffer for his sake. Well, that's all well and good to hear and to be forewarned. But until it happens, you don't know how bad it can get. These Hebrew Christians tasted something of how bad it can get. And so they began to have serious thoughts about their new life and this new understanding they had of the Jewish Messiah. And so they wondered, is it time to turn back? Is it better that we do go back? Should we give up? Should we go back to where we were before and then we can end all the hardships? And so they sounded very much like Israel that wanted to return to Egypt. These were doubtful Christians. Their faith was assaulted and it was weakened and so they were desperate in need of assurance. Now we understand, of course, they were Christians They weren't in danger of losing their salvation. Salvation can never be lost. But they were in danger of making a mistake, a terrible mistake that would ruin their effectiveness in their Christian lives that would help them to endure. And then also uh, what would make them to be good witnesses of the faith of Christ. It was their weakened faith, not saving faith, but the faith by which we live that was the trouble. It's the faith that keeps us going forward for Christ when we don't always understand what God is doing and and where God is taking us. And I dare say that there are many Christians in the middle of this pandemic that wonder, where is God taking us? And they're concerned about their jobs. They're concerned about their health. I hope that they have concern about the church. And so they're anxious and are afraid of the future. And so we need to be reminded of the God we serve and of the promises that he makes. And all of his promises are fulfilled in one person. They are anchored in Jesus Christ. And so the author of Hebrews addresses the wavering faith of these Jewish Christians. And he considers it from two powerful perspectives. His first perspective is from the negative side. They're tempted to go back to the old covenant, which tells them that they need more sacrifices. Going back required serious changes. It meant the reinstitution of the sacrificial system. And to this, the author will answer in chapter 10 that the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. And he says that sacrifices were made year after year because there was nothing in those sacrifices that could offer them a permanent solution for their sins. And so that old sacrificial system wasn't adequate to meet their needs. And then furthermore, he tells them there is nothing to go back to. The sacrifices of the Old Testament were fulfilled in Christ. And thus to go back is to reject the sacrifice of Christ. And he says, if you reject Christ, there is no sacrifice for sin. 
The author obviates the temptation to go back to the past because there's no hope there. And then he tells them that although it's true they were in persecution, they'd not yet faced the worst case scenario. In the 12th chapter he wrote, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And that's a reference back to the 11th chapter and the heroes of the faith that you find there. These were people that stood the test and then went to their death still believing in God's promises. The Hebrews weren't there yet. They'd not yet resisted to blood, that is to death. And the faith they had had not been tested in such devastating ways as their forefathers. And so the writer tells them to think of Christ. For consider him that endured the contradiction of sinners against himself. Think of Christ. Think about his pain. Think of his humiliation. Think of his suffering. And yet he went to the cross without a moment's hesitation. And so he says to these Christians, you've still got your life. You haven't made the ultimate sacrifice of life. And your afflictions are less than what Christ did for you. And I think that we learn a lesson in this, that, that God has little patience with all the flimsy excuses we make that we can't work for him. He doesn't accept the excuses that we can't go to church because we're just upset about things. Well, I certainly think that we do have a duty to be cautious about coronavirus for the good health of us all. But at the same time, we ought not to run scared at every threat. Now we consider Paul who is beaten and bitten by snakes. He was imprisoned. He faced hundred perils, a hundred perils. I, I think how he said that he was in danger of robbers. The mountain passes that he went through in Asia Minor as a missionary were filled with thieves and robbers. And I wonder how many of us would make that trip with the threat of life and limb. Well, the writer approached this first from the negative side. There's nothing for you to return to. And you've not approached what believers in the past had to live through. And certainly you've not experienced what Christ went through. Well, that's the negative side. You might even say it's the shameful side. What's wrong with you? He says, why can't you stand up? Why aren't you believers that can stand? Why can't you stand like believers that were before you? Why is it that you're so ready to give up easily? Well, sometimes preachers need to go to the negative side. The Bible often does. Sometimes the approach is to shame the people of God into their responsibilities but shame isn't the only way that you get people to shift their thinking and end their fears. Positive affirmations are also needed. And so after presenting the negative, his second perspective is to take a positive approach. And this is the way he achieves the most satisfactory results. So he calls on his readers to consider God's promises. Consider who made those promises. And consider... That these promises are for those who are born into the family of God through Jesus Christ. He appeals to Jewish Christians from the perspective of their new birth. That has made them heirs of God's promises. Now listen to the way that the Apostle Paul expressed this in Galatians. Galatians is one of the earliest epistles. So the Hebrews most likely would have access to this letter. And Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 26, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Now Paul taught that distinctions between Jews and Gentiles were abandoned in the faith of Christ. But Jewish Christians were sure to note that in Christ, this is the way that they have been made heirs of Abraham and the promises that were made to him. 
Now, by experience, we know the promise of good things to come is a strong incentive to obey God's will. And so the Bible is very quick to encourage us to remain faithful because there is a prize that comes at the end. And there's nothing wrong at all for God's people to look at the prize at the end. Paul kept his eye on the prize. He said, I keep pressing forward towards it. And so the scriptures continually promise rewards for the faithful and we are to keep our eyes on that reward. Now, you see in our text that, of course, these Hebrews would sit up, they would pay attention when the author mentions Abraham. Abraham is the father of the faithful. Abraham is the father of their nation. Abraham was called by Jehovah God and he pressed forward and he left the Ur of Chaldees because of God's promise. And what was that promise founded upon? Well, in verse 13, God promised Abraham and then it says God took an oath. God never needs to take an oath. God only needs to state it, then it's as sure as it can be. But he took an oath. And that's an accommodation for our senses and our assurance. We swear oaths and we always swear by something that's greater than us. In courts of law, we used to put our hand on a Bible and we would swear an oath to tell the truth, recognizing that the Bible represents God who is greater than us. Now, the author says that of Hebrews says that God swore an oath, and since there is none who is greater than God, he swore upon himself. And so it's as if the promise is doubly sure because of this oath. That oath is not needed except to speak to our minds that God doubly emphasizes the power of his word, the surety of his promises, and the infallibility and the immutability of it. For men verily swear by the greater, an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. In verse 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs a promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Now imagine a promise that is sworn by the oath of the creator of heaven and earth. What could be made sure? It is impossible for God to lie. Now, I want to show you three aspects of the sure and steady anchor. Christ is representative of these, and he's the refuge that you need to know that your soul is safe and secure. We have nothing to fear if we are in Christ. He's there for us in life and in death. And so if you are afraid of death, just remember, Paul said, it's far better to leave this world because then we are with Christ. Now, if you're taking notes, these are the aspects that we want to examine today. First is the anchor of hope. Secondly is the anchor of steadfastness. And then thirdly is the anchor of faith. Now, first we speak of hope, the anchor of hope. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, that we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. Now let's think about this word hope. In our common usage of the word hope, embedded in its meaning is an element of doubt. If I say that I hope I get a pay raise, there isn't a, a sense in that that I'm sure that I will. During this pandemic, there are some employers that offered more money to their employees if they would stay on the job and not flee to their houses. I've heard about health care and some grocery stores that have offered incentives, incentives of higher pay for employees to go to work and to serve the public. And we commend those who take that risk to serve us. Now, we think of health care workers. We think of our public safety officers. But then now we also need to consider that checker at the grocery store. Uh, that person also has his fears, but he still stands in there. Think about those people. And when, when you need to go to the store, commend them for that. And that's a good thing for you to do. But if not for these special circumstances, most people that hope to get a pay raise either don't get it 
or they don't get anything like what they hope for. There's hope that it might happen, but probably more doubt that it won't. And so hope is accompanied by doubt because hope doesn't guarantee the surety of anything. But thank God when he speaks of hope, this is not his meaning. To God, hope is the same as accomplishment. Hope only means that we don't have it yet, but it's as sure to come as if we were already holding it in our hands. Now let me give you an example. If you would turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, this is the passage where Paul speaks of the high calling of God in Christ. And he says in verse number 14 that he pressed towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And certainly he saw that out in front of him as his future. In 1 Corinthians 15, he spoke of the coming resurrection and he encouraged the Corinthians to keep on working. And he said, because your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And so in other words, you're sure to reap the rewards of your labor. Well, here in Philippians chapter 3, he writes in verse number 20, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Our conversation is is in heaven. And that's old English that means our citizenship is in heaven. Well, obviously, we're not in heaven yet. We're looking to go to heaven. We hope to go to heaven. Is there doubt in that hope? No, there, there isn't any doubt because before we leave this life, our citizenship is already marked down and it's recorded in heaven. And we've secured our place there by our faith in Jesus Christ. And so in this passage, Paul gives us a look at the roll call of heaven. And there we have a peek at a home that already has our name on the mailbox. We already possess a deed to this home. And it's our hope in the infallible one who has all the power to make it happen. In, in the end of that uh, verse there in Philippians 3.21, it says, According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. And not only this, the return of Christ from heaven, which we look forward to, is also termed by Paul to be the blessed hope. He said in Titus 2.13, Looking for that blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our hope of heaven is as sure as the promise that Christ will return from heaven. And when he left, the angel said, he will be back. Now another place that shows the surety of our hope is in Romans 5, in verse number 5. It says, and hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which he has given unto us. Hope does not make us ashamed. And here Paul means that we can't be disappointed in this hope. Why? Well, because God shows how much he loves us by giving us his spirit to abide in us as a guarantee of it. Well, I could go on and on with this. I can show you many more scriptures about hope and the surety of it. I don't have time, but I do want to read Romans 8. That is one of these great anchors of hope. In Romans chapter 8, in verse number 29 and 30, For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, you don't need to worry. I'm not going to give you a, another sermon on election and predestination. I only want, to, want you to see that all the verbs in these two verses are in the past tense. God did for no. That's past tense. He did predestinate. That's past tense. He called, that's past tense. He justified, past tense. He glorified, past tense.
past tense. Now surely you understand that three, three of these past tense verbs are still future for those that are yet to believe and are foreordained by God to believe. They will be called, they will be justified, and amazingly he throws this in, they will be glorified. Those three verbs are in the past tense because God considers them done. In his wisdom, in his grace, in his divine determination, these are so sure that God considers it done. Now our text in verse 18 says that we can lay hold on that hope. It is a determined hope. Well, how can we be so sure? Well, it's sure because the chain to this anchor of hope goes through the veil into the throne room of God. The Hebrews would recognize this reference. It's a tabernacle and temple reference. The veil hung in the tabernacle and it was in the temple to separate the two compartments. And behind that veil is the presence of God. The veil was torn in two when Jesus died. And God is accessed because the death of Christ opened the way and made it possible. And so if you are sure that Christ died, then you can be sure that he fastened your anchor to God's throne. He is your hope. And that hope is as sure as Christ's death is sure. Now there, there's more to say about that, so let's just hold on to it. Because before we'll, we're done, we'll discover that his death alone is not enough to make the anchor sure. It needs more. It needs his present life to make it sure. There is no hope in a dead Christ. Now let me show you the second aspect of this anchor. Number two is the anchor of steadfastness. In verse 19, which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Steadfast in Hebrews 6.19 comes from a word that means the base. It's similar in use to the foundation of a house. The foundation of the house is the base on which it sits. And the strength of the base, that is of the foundation, the strength of it is essential to the structural soundness of the house. And then used in another way, as it is in this text, it implies or can be used as a nautical term. And in this case, it would refer to the floor of the ocean. It's the ocean bed. The anchor's not in the sands on the seashore. It's not in seaweed. The anchor is not attached to a piece of coral. Well, the anchor goes down into the base, down to the ocean floor, and it grips it. It's steadfast because the ocean floor can't break away. It's attached to an immovable base. And this anchor is so solid that it keeps us from moving too far, too far away. Now, there are four things. Four things that the anchor of steadfastness does. First, the anchor of steadfastness keeps us from drifting. It keeps us from drifting. I want you to think of your Christian life. Are there times that you tend to drift away from fundamental practices that you know that you should be faithful to do? Do you drift away from your Bible reading? Do you drift away and fail to pray? Do you drift away and miss too much church? And you put other things in front of the church? Well, did you ever feel the Holy Spirit jerk your chain? Did you ever listen to a sermon, maybe like this one, that caused you to stop and think? And you get that feeling of conviction in your gut. Has the Holy Spirit ever said to you, Where are you going? Has he ever said to you, hey, you need to stop. Where are you headed? What are you doing? Don't you know you need to spend time with me? Well, the anchor of steadfastness doesn't let you get too far away. Well, I know there are some that just keep on drifting. They fall out. They keep on drifting because there's nothing to hold them. And these are people that John the Apostle would say, well, you know, they're drifting away because they never were a part of us. Their anchor wasn't steadfast because it was never anchored in the bedrock of Jesus Christ. And so I can tell you, if you're drifting, 
And the Holy Spirit doesn't jerk your chain. It can only mean that the Holy Spirit is not on the end of your chain. And that's a fearful place to be because the Holy Spirit does not let his people drift too far away. And so this is when we need to sit up and pay attention to Paul who said, examine yourselves whether you are in the faith. In other words, there must be proof that you're in the faith or you're not in the faith. If the Holy Spirit doesn't chastise and doesn't convict when you drift, you're not in the faith. And that's a very frightening place to be because an unanchored ship is soon shipwrecked on the shores of unbelief. Now secondly, the anchor of steadfastness sets boundaries. Christianity is a relationship that maintains certain standards. And I'll, I'll put it to you simply. There, there are some things that Christians just shouldn't do. And there are some places that Christians shouldn't go. And there are some things that Christians should never say. The anchor of steadfastness sets a boundary that you as a Christian should never go beyond. Now when a ship lets down anchor, the anchor keeps it within a certain boundary. The anchor holds it in place so that it doesn't drift to the rocks. The anchor keeps the boat within a certain boundary so that while people are fishing or uh, they're attending to other things, they may not be aware that the ship is, or the boat is slowly moving off its course. I think there are many Christians that appear to be doing their best to pull up their anchor. And if they're not trying to pull it up, they're trying to stretch the chain. They, they just want to move the anchor over a little bit. Oh, please, just, just a little bit more. This sin won't hurt, but it does hurt. And there's wisdom in the one to whom this anchor is attached. And there's a reason that his chain is only too long, not too long. You lengthen the chain and you end up in danger. Now, if Jesus let the chain be too long, then your life for him would be shipwrecked. There's no safety in a slack chain. Don't even ask for it. Christians, pay attention to the boundaries. Oh, yes, the anchor is sure, but the Word of God teaches that you also have a responsibility to guard your life. Don't tempt God. Don't pull against the chain. Your boundaries are marked by the Word of God. That's our rule. That's our practice. Our boundaries are marked by the Word of God. Like, like a buoy that marks the channel, the Word is the guide to keep us in areas of safe sailing. Well, then thirdly, the anchor of steadfastness gives access. Hebrews 2 verse 6, or rather Ephesians 2 verse 6, says that we are made to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, you can take that back to what I said about hope. Our hope is sure because we are already sitting in heavenly places. And you say, well, how's that? I'm down here. He's up there. Well, I'll tell you how. He's on the anchor end, and I'm on the end that receives all the benefits of the place where that anchor is fastened. When I fall on my knees and pray, my anchor is fastened to the throne of grace. And when I tug on the chain, that tug pierces the heavenlies and it touches the very heart of God. You ever seen in old movies where uh, a diver puts on a diving helmet and a diving suit? And before he goes into the water, he's instructed to give three tugs on the rope if he's in trouble. And that's what happens when you pray. You tug on the rope and then heaven knows that you need help. Heaven goes into action to help take care of that problem. See, God's never going to let you face anything alone. He won't let you drown. And that's part of the hope that the author gave to persecuted Christians. In the fourth chapter, he wrote, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Why can we go boldly? We can because our chain goes there. We're connected by the everlasting anchor to God's throne room. And then fourthly, the anchor of steadfastness is our power source. Now try to get this picture in your mind. The anchor holds in the place where everything our senses perceive had its beginning. 
In Acts, Paul said, in him we live and move and have our being. The power that sustains the universe, the power that keeps the sun shining, the power that keeps the planets in their orbits is the same power that we use to overcome troubling times. You remember in Matthew chapter 8, I mentioned earlier, Jesus was on the sea with his disciples and there was a storm and they were afraid. This is in the same chapter where just before the Lord had healed a leper. And then he healed a servant with palsy. And that was when Jesus didn't even go into the house. He just said to the centurion, he was his master, he said, go your way, your, your servant is healed. It's in the same chapter where Jesus healed the Pope's mother-in-law. That would be Peter's wife's mother, if you didn't catch it. And then he cast demons out of people. Then after that, he was tired. He got into the boat and he fell asleep. The disciples started across the sea with him as he slept. And as they crossed the sea, there was a storm that arose. He was asleep in the boat. And after all the miracles the disciples had seen him do, they fearfully awoke him and said, Master, save us, we perish. And Jesus said, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? And then he rebuked the sea and calmed the storm. Why are you fearful, he said. Now he's here today and he asked the same questions. Why are you fearful of coronavirus? Haven't you seen what God can do? Now, I don't promise that you won't get it. I, I don't promise that you won't die from it. But I do promise that if you're a child of God, the power of God will take you up with the same power that he used to create the world and raise Jesus from the dead. What do the scriptures say? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So the power that sustains and the power that keeps you steady is not yours. The God of the universe is your help. Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? So there's the anchor of hope and the anchor of steadfastness. And now lastly, and I, and I must hurry, number three is the anchor of faith. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whither the forerunner for us is entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, we return to this tabernacle reference the Hebrew author's, uh, Hebrews author used. He, he says in the last part of verse 19 that Christ entered the room behind the veil. Now, in verse 20, he mentions the high priestly office of Christ. And those two things are, are references that they can understand. Now, as you know from our series in the tabernacle, the place behind the veil is the Holy of Holies. In that place, there's the Ark of the Covenant with its mercy seat. These articles were patterned after things that are in heaven. And the high priest went behind the veil on one day each year. That was on the great day of atonement. And his responsibility was to take the blood of the sacrifice and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And this was symbolic, the blood of Christ that made atonement for our souls. His blood is a sacrifice that God required. Now, the tearing of the veil in the temple was to show that Christ entered that place once for all and he took his own blood and he cleared out the way for us to approach God. Now, as no Israelite could enter into that place but the high priest, so none of us could get to God unless... Jesus Christ took that veil out of the way and let us enter. And today, the way that we enter is that we are a new kingdom of priests, and it's by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ we've been made priests and are permitted to enter. And so for Jesus to take the blood in for us, he must be alive. He died on the cross, but the author affirms he is alive to take his blood into heaven. Our faith is not in a dead Christ on the cross, and thus we never wear a crucifix. Our Lord is not dead. He is alive, and he continues to live for us. We're not saved and kept saved because we hold out faithful. We're saved because Christ is always faithful. He's living, and he's 
working and he's always interceding for us. And the author of Hebrews makes that claim as well. In Hebrews 7, verses 24 and 25, But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is also... Uh, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And so here is where our faith is anchored. It's anchored in the living Christ. And my salvation is secure because I know that when I'm not faithful, he's still faithful to me. And here the word of God says that he swore it with an oath. He promised it and he sealed it. In the blood of his own dear son. And so I know that there is nothing that can harm me. There's nothing that can separate me from the love of God. Because God paid too high a price for me. My faith can't be in anything more powerful than in Jesus Christ. And so I'm afraid. Am I afraid what will happen to me? No. Christ the sure and steady anchor. As we face the wave of death. When these trials give way to glory as we draw our final breath, we will cross that great horizon, clouds behind, and life secure, and the calm will be the better for the storms that we endure. Christ, the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true, we will hold fast to the anchor. It shall never be removed. Why are we fearful about what's happening today? Is God's oath too little assurance for us? Now our final breath, no matter if it comes from sword, disease, if it comes from famine, or even if it comes from old age, it's nothing to fear. Christ, the sure and steady anchor, fastened us to God's throne beyond the horizon. Our eternal life in Him is safe and secure, always safe and secure. Our chain is attached to that anchor. Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you now and we realize, Father, that there is a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. Many people are terribly worried about what's going to happen next. Fear about their lives, fear about their jobs, Fear about economic conditions, even fear that when it all settles down, that life is not going to be anything like what we had before. First thing that we ought to do, Lord, we know, is to have our faith securely anchored in you and to know that this life is not what Christianity is all about. Our life is in Christ, and we're fastened to an anchor that's in the heavenlies. And we have surety that when we die, that's where we're going to go. And as we live, that's always on our mind. As the Word of God says to set our affections on things that are in heaven, not things that are here in this life. And so Lord, we pray that you would give comfort to those who are anxious. Help them to understand the hope that they have. This hope that we have is absolutely sure. It can't be made any surer. Because Almighty God in heaven swore an oath to make it sure. Help us to put our faith and our trust in that. Knowing, Lord, that you'll always take care of us. You'll take care of our church. Some are worried about that. What's going to happen to the church? Can we keep it all together? We don't really need to have fear of that. It all belongs to you. Whatever you decide to do with it, you are the sovereign God. And you are the refuge for our weary souls. Bless us now, Lord. Bless all the folks that are at home today and they're worshiping in their homes and taking time to, to listen to this message, to sing the songs. And Lord, we just pray that more hope has been put into their hearts today by what they've heard, by what they've sung, by what they've prayed, by all the considerations that we have that today is the Lord's day. It, it belongs to you. Lord, may we use it for you. And each and every day, to be used for you as we look for you to return, to come and take us home. Thank you, Lord. Be with us. Bless us throughout this week as we look forward next week to Easter and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Lord, keep us hopeful, always hopeful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
God of grace, amazing wonder, irresistible and free. Oh, the miracle of mercy, Jesus reaches down to me. God of grace, I stand in wonder as my God restores my soul. His own blood has paid my ransom, awesome cost to make me whole. God of grace, who loved and knew me long before the world began, sent my Savior down from heaven, perfect God and perfect man. God of grace, I trust in Jesus, I'm accepted as his own. Every day his grace sustains me as I lean on him alone. God of grace, I stand astounded, cleansed, forgiven, and secure. All my fears are now confounded, and my hope is ever sure. God of grace, now crowned in glory, where one day I'll see your face, and forever I'll adore you in your everlasting grace. It's been wonderful to be with you this Sunday morning. Uh, we do look forward to our services again next Sunday morning. Unfortunately, with the band, we're not able to be together at that time either. So we encourage you to tune in to uh, listen to us, and we hope you have a good and safe week. And I want to remind you that uh, when you're through watching this video, if you just take a little bit of time to uh, tap on the um, button that tells you there that you can subscribe to the channel. It makes it a whole lot easier to get to it, and you can see all the other videos that we have produced. So if you might want to do that, become a subscriber. And then uh, share the video with friends and others who are not able to get out to hear the Word of God, perhaps in their, in their own churches. And then just another word. I want to talk to you for just a moment about our tithes and offerings. Uh, since we're not able to gather, we don't have a collection of those uh, as the assembly. So the best way to do that is to mail your tithes and offerings to the church. The address will be on the screen just after we uh, end this recording. So if you will just uh, send your tithes and offerings there. If that's not possible for you to do that, please contact your deacon and we'll make arrangements. Uh, I know that many people are concerned about that and we thank the Lord that they are. So let's, let's support our church, let's keep the Word of God going out, and let's just uh, keep on looking for that day. We hope that's very soon that we'll be able to come back together as the people of God. Many thanks to those who are here today that helped to produce this, this uh, service. Uh, we thank our musicians. We thank Tate Jarrell and Melissa, uh, Melissa Jarrell for singing and playing, and for Steve and Donna for running recording aspects of this, and Thank the preacher as well, because he's here too. So we praise God for uh, all of Berean Baptist Church. Let's close with a word of prayer. We hope to see you soon. Father, thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for bringing us together. Bless our people in their homes. And we pray, Lord, that we take the message to heart. Keep our hope always in Jesus Christ, that anchor of steadfastness. In his name we pray. Thank you for listening to this presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Roner Park, California. If you would like further information about our church, please feel free to call us at area code 707-584-7275 or write to us at Brian Baptist Church, 6298 Country Club Drive, Roner Park, California, 94928. Additionally, you may visit us online at www.bebaptist.org.